If I tell you what, every, every Sunday I, I ponder, I, I, I go back before the Lord. And, and, and quite honestly, like last week and the previous week, I, I, I finish up what I'm doing and I, and I sit before the Lord and I say, I have absolutely no direction for the next of this series. I know there's a series. I mean, I know that he's not done yet. I have no idea what he wants to say to you. you know, and that's an intimidating place to start, I'll be honest. You know? Uh, but I, I don't know if it brings you security, but, I, but that's where I start every single week. You know, just laying it out before the Lord, saying, I, I'm willing to go. <sighs> sorry, sissies cry, sorry. <clears throat> no, I'm joking, I'm joking, calm down. You know, just laying it before the Lord and saying, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go wherever you want to go. And he's just been, he's continuing to, to open up this topic of, of poverty to me and, 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 and particularly the mentality that we carry, this, this mentality uh, that needs to be renewed, our, our minds that need to be removed, uh, renewed, and just the, the identification of that uh, in, in our lives and, and in our hearts. And, and, and I'll be honest, it's, it's one of those things that's like an onion. There, there are many layers to this thing. You know, and, and if we can have our eyes open, we can begin to identify it. I mean, because how many of you know, if you don't recognize there's a problem, you can't fix it. I mean, the first step is recognition. When you, when you can hear something that, that, that I say and go, ooh, wait. And, and you know, it's just an opportunity for Holy Spirit to break in and to speak to our hearts in, in a way that we may not have been able to hear Him otherwise because, frankly, we're deceived. I don't know whether you know, like I don't know whether that's God or, or or not, but this is the kind of the way I've always thought. This is the way that I always do. So, so if I can say something that 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 awakens us to the truth of the gospel, the truth of Scripture, and, and that awakens us to the the truth of really where we are in our thinking, and that initiates something in your heart that results in the renewing of your mind, that, then then we've won. And, and I, just, I, I just continue to, to wrestle with this topic today. Uh, we're going to be wrestling from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to start right at the top. And, and I'm actually going to, I mean, instead of like a three-point sermon and a big bow and a conclusion at the end where you're like, yep, I, I got the point, and you reiterated the point, and you concluded it, and we all feel good, I, I, I'm gonna, we're going to do, we're going to excavate the scriptures a little bit, like verse by verse, if that makes any sense. So, so we're, we're headed somewhere, uh, but we're not going to arrive there completely today. Of course, we've got Christmas and stuff coming up, so we may have a little bit of a diversion there, a good diversion, you know, but, but for now, just know we're not necessarily going to arrive completely completely at conclusions, but we're just going to take a little bit of a journey together. Is that okay? You know, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you know, starting from, very, from the very beginning in verse 1, the, the Apostle Paul is declaring that he's out to take up an offering from the Gentile churches. How many of you know the most qualified apostle to go to the Pharisees and to the Jews, was sent by God to the Gentile churches to go and reach them. I just love how God, how God works, right? So that it's not him with eloquent words and, and with persuasive arguments, but it's the only thing that he's got. Resting back on the power of God, the, the glory of God. I'm completely dependent on you to show up, God, because I don't know how to reach these people, because they don't know anything about the history of the Jews. You know what I mean? Like, like this is how God does it. So he's ministering with these churches, he's working with them, and he's He's gaining, or he's gathering up a large offering from these Gentile churches, multitude of different churches, in order to take this offering back to Jerusalem, where they were under severe persecution. Now, not just in Jerusalem. I mean, they were, the persecution was rampant. It was, it was all over the place. Uh, but particularly in Jerusalem, they were getting slammed pretty good. You know, and so Paul's going around the Gentile churches. I think there's a lot to this, but suffice it to say, he's gathering up an offering of money that he's getting ready to take back to this church, starting out in verse 1. It says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you that the grace of God, which has been given in the churches... Or excuse me, I'm going to read that again, and we're going to start it right this time. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. I want to take a pause just for a second to highlight something to you. You know, oftentimes when we consider the topic of grace in the scriptures, usually we're applying it to grace as a result of sin. Like, I've gotten myself into a pickle, and I, I, I've, I have sinned, and God releases grace to me so that lightning bolts don't fly from heaven and burn me up into a, you know, 
KFC chicken, right? Like, and that's, that's our view of grace, except that so many scriptures seem to paint a little bit different picture of this idea of grace, and, and, and such we have here. Grace in this context, and again, I'd submit to you in most contexts, uh, isn't something that gets released necessarily to help me not be a piece of KFC chicken. Rather, it's something that's released to me as an empowerment. See, we talked about last week that the gospel of Jesus Christ has opened up heaven for you and I to have access to it today, right now. So there are resources in God's kingdom that he's opened up to us to have access. I I want to submit to you that grace is one of the resources of heaven that's being released to us, but not to alleviate the stress over sin, rather, quite the contrary, to empower us in the midst of our circumstances to be successful. The Macedonians are reaching into heaven to what is accessible to them, this thing called grace, and it's empowering them to be able to withstand the trials that they themselves are currently under and to be successful within those trials. Verse 2. That in a great ordeal <clears throat> excuse me, of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of the participation and support of the saints. Guys, this is like polar opposite to this poverty mentality that we've been talking about. In fact, I would call this the royal mentality, the the, the kingdom mindset that God's actually calling us into. Now, Macedonia was itself, according to Paul, like massively persecuted. They were so massively persecuted that at the time of this writing, Paul declares they were deeply impoverished. I I want you to get a hold of this just for a second, because I I don't think we can fully comprehend, you know, what this looks like. You know, the the year before I went to India, uh, North Bengal, uh, excuse me, West Bengal, India, you know, up in the hills, uh, overlooking the Himalayan mountains, one year prior to my arrival, two missionaries were burned alive in their their automobile. That's persecution. (laughs) You know, like Macedonia was under fire. You know, they're, they're looking around and, and, and they're losing neighbors and, and loved ones and friends and family, cousins. And like people are dying. You know, they're, they're under the, the fire of persecution such that the, the, it's, it resulted in them being deeply, it says, deeply impoverished. I want to submit to you, I think probably what's happening is, because this is what we've seen throughout history of persecution, you have people, like motley bands of people coming in to persecute the saints of God, those who have said, Jesus is my Messiah, coming in and they're, and they're robbing from them. Nope, I think I'm going to commandeer that car. That's going to be mine now. You know, those mules, those are going to be mine now. You know, and you have them invading family homes and, and, and running people out of their homes and, and stealing their family farms. I want you just to picture, just for a moment, that you've been in a fifth-generation family farm. This is a, you're an agrarian society. This is what you do. You know, you've been farming for generations. Grandpa's, 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 grandpa's started this whole deal. You know what I mean? And it's been handed down, and we've got a little something here. And we've got the old house. And, and in this culture, like, everybody lives together still. Like, grandma and grandpa, the ones that are left, are still hanging out with us. Like, this is the, the family farm. And these guys, this band of persecutors, they come and they, and they rob you of your family farm. Now, how do you feel in that moment? Everywhere you look, something's getting crushed. Somebody's getting abused. There's injustice absolutely everywhere. How do you feel about what's happening around you? How is that affecting your demeanor? How is it affecting the way that you think? Maybe particularly about your enemies. Here's what strikes me about this. In the midst of some horrible persecution. Paul declares of the Macedonians that they had an abundance of joy. Now, you tell me, how is that possible? How is it possible that when they look out their window, neighbors are being murdered for their faith? Their assets are being stolen, homes being taken, they're being driven from their culture, from their city, being denied jobs, being denied service, 
you know, to the basic needs that they need in the grocery store. Everywhere they look is injustice and what's declared of them by Paul the observer. They have an abundance of joy. How is that possible? How many of you know that God does not intend for his people to be swayed to and fro by the waves of life's circumstances? How many of you have ever experienced negative life circumstances? Where you're like, oh my gosh, I see the wave coming. God hasn't equipped you. He hasn't prepared you. His desire for you is not that the wave comes crashing in and ruins everything and twists the way that you think and ruins your life. That's, that's not his design for you. He's actually designed for you in the midst of those trials to maintain what is not accessible to the world, and that's his supernatural joy, which is your strength. I want to submit to you also this morning that our success is not... Rather, my identity, I, ugh, I'm going to get it right. I'll just look. Circumstances don't define my success. Circumstances don't define my success. The way I think defines my success. This is what we've been talking about, renewing our minds. Circumstances don't declare to me whether I'm a winner or I'm a loser. The way that I think about myself in the midst of those trials determines whether I'm a winner or a loser. It's the way that I think that determines my success. I don't think there's a soul in this room who would point to characters in history like Henry Ford, or maybe Thomas Edison, or even a modern day figure like, I was gonna say James Gall. <laughs> James Gall, you know, or Dave Ramsey. You know, I don't think there's a soul in here who would look at those gentlemen and go, Oh, yeah, those guys were not successful at all. In fact, those guys are total failures. There's nobody in here who would say that. But what you need to know about their history is that failure marked their existence for a big period of time before they ever had a breakthrough into success. Right? I mean, there were a lot of trials and failures before they ever got to the place of breakthrough in their life. Well, what's the difference? They believed that they were successful. And they refuse to come under the lie of circumstances that wants to prophesy to the contrary. That's the way that we think. Circumstances don't define my identity. I'm not a victim. Uh, but somebody just victimized you. Yes, someone did victimize me but I refuse to allow my identity to be infused with that, with that victimization. I'm not a victim, I'm an overcomer, even if I was victimized. See, the moment that I believe in my heart that I'm a victim, I, I literally, in the spirit, it's like I've put a, a light on the front porch of my life and I draw stuff, like demonic spirits and, and people. And I mean, we, you know, we battle not against flesh and blood, right? And demonic spirits and, 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 and offensive people. I draw them to my life to offend me again. When I believe that I'm a victim, I will create a perpetual cycle of victimization in my life. But when I believe that I'm an overcomer, the front porch light that I put on in my life sends out a very, very different signal. Because I'm no longer motivated and, and, and moved by fear. I'm partnering instead with, the play, with hope, with the God of hope. And when I partner with hope over my life as an overcomer, it inspires confidence. And that confidence gives me a very, very different result in my life. Amen. Circumstances don't determine my joy. My joy is not based upon my circumstances. See, so many of us, we have, we have a bad day at work. Anybody ever have a bad day? I'm having one right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bad day at work, you know, and it's like, if, if we could just take a second and, and step back from it, and, and our own history has taught us this, just a, just a moment to look at it, we would all agree 
This wasn't a life's devastating situation. It's going to get better, right? Like, this wasn't the end all, this thing that happened at work today. And yet, somehow, even with that revelation that this thing that happened really, at the grand scheme of things, isn't that big of a deal in my life, even with that understanding in our brains, we take that bad day right home to our families. And then we spew it all over our wives and our, and our husbands and all over our children. And, you know, it's like my bad day now has to become their bad day. Why? I don't, misery loves company, I guess. And it's like, I, I mean, I have had times when Misty was like, it's been a while, thank God. I've literally had Misty go, you know what? Mm-mm. You, need to, you need to get your head right with Jesus. You know, because whatever you're doing here is shifting the atmosphere in our home, and I'm not going to have it. And I'm like, I don't really like you right now. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> but, but a kingdom mentality, a, a royal mentality, it doesn't latch on to all of the garbage of circumstances, all of the stuff, and allow it to toss me to and fro. A, a royal mentality in the midst of the trial, the stuff that's happening, the injustice that's happening in my life, in the midst of those things that are real, they're tangible, it's not a de- sense of denial, they're, they're really happening to me, but in the midst of that, a royal mentality has the ability to partner with the God of hope and go, look, I don't like what's happening right now, but my God said he's for me, not against me. My God said he's going to work all things for good. That includes this mess, and I can't conceive of how that's going to happen, but I don't have to conceive of how that's going to happen. I just have to keep my eyes on the author and the finisher of my faith. The royal mentality refuses to come under the circumstances of life that then begin to dictate to me how I think and how I feel, how I feel about the people that are around me, and they even begin to prophesy to me the outcome of this situation. Oh, it's going to go bad. And I, with my own lips, begin to partner with that prophetic word and declare it of my life. This is not going to get better. I'm never going to be able to get another job. You know, never going to be able to find another mate. Never going to. We just begin with our own lips to declare in partnership with what that thing is prophesying to us. But a royal mentality partners with God's proclamation, with God's hope. And it allows us to be like the Macedonians who in the midst of deep and dark trials can lay hold of what God is doing in faith and allow it in the moment to release a joy that the world doesn't understand, can't contain, don't even have access to. We're not only called to maintain hopefulness, we're also called to maintain, in the midst of our trials, gratefulness. I, I almost, I mean, they're, they're tied together, but I lean a little bit towards almost saying gratefulness is more important of the two. Because if you can apply gratefulness to your life, hope is the natural outspring of that. I want to give you a tool right now when all the stuff is breaking loose around you, and with your own eyes and in your own mind, you're looking out and you're like, there is not one solitary good thing happening in my life right now. Literally, everybody is against me. I want you to take a moment and say, what five things can I identify God is doing right now? He's not doing anything. You need to pray a little longer. You need to stop and you need to ask yourself, what am I thankful for right now? I'm not thankful for anything. Dog died, all hell's breaking loose. Boss said they're they're cutting people loose. Wife was mean to me when I got home. (laughs) Again. (laughs) Not thankful for anything. What are you thankful for in the midst of your trial? And what is God doing right now? I'm telling you, you keep that tool in the back pocket and you pull it out in the midst of your trial, this is going to be the single greatest thing that's going to correct you to God's divine plumb line of perspective to give you his eyes to see what's happening and to partner you with his hope, with his purposes, such that the manifestation in your life, just like these guys, is that you have an abundance of joy. This is the thing. Macedonians, they, they weren't victims. They weren't victims. 
They, they, didn't, they didn't think like that. I, I want to propose to you just for a second. These individuals are deeply impoverished, deeply impoverished, deeply impacted by the persecution that's going on all around them. But they don't partner with it. They refuse to partner with the negative garbage. And instead, they look at it as an opportunity to partner with the God of hope over their own lives, over their own situations. Remember when Mark Hendrickson was here? Some of you were here. I I loved his perspective. Because when trials and tribulations came, when there wasn't enough money to do something, when whatever the trial is, he's able to look back and kind of go, well, it's going to be exciting to see what God does about that situation. Most of us, we we come under it. We partner with fret and worry and anxiety and fear. and We're driven. We're tossed to and fro. And we begin to partner, as I said previously, with our own mouths, with the declaration, the prophetic declaration from these circumstances that this thing is not going to turn out for my good. A royal mentality refuses to engage in that. The Macedonians refused to engage in that. This was an opportunity. Here's what strikes me. The word here says... When this opportunity came up for them to give an offering, mind you, they are deeply impoverished from their own situation. The scripture says that they begged Paul for an opportunity to be a part of this offering. They begged Paul to be a part of this offering. Look, no, I don't think anybody would have faulted them, except for the kingdom. (laughs) If they had said something like this, Paul, hey, Who do you think you are? Jerusalem? Forget Jerusalem. Have you seen Macedonia, brother? I mean, hello, my neighbor just yesterday lost her house. You know, I got like 14 dogs and three donkeys in my living room. You know, like, like, have, have you seen the streets? Like, everybody's being persecuted everywhere. We're losing everything. We, as a result of our circumstances, we are deeply, deeply impoverished. What about me? What about us? What about our families? What about our people? And you know what? They'd have been right. They'd have been absolutely right. Because they were coming under that. That was the level of persecution they were experiencing. They were deeply impoverished. But the moment that we begin to think like that, it takes us right down this road into bitterness and ungratefulness and entitlement. And and from this place of, of bitterness and entitlement, usually what happens is when people finally resend, send the, the relief crew to come and to help them in this situation, because they're not grateful, but because they were entitled to it, And quite frankly, it didn't come as fast as we thought it should have. You're like, yeah, I know you finally finally showed up, but I mean, honestly, you should have been here a week ago because even when when the help finally arrives, they cannot receive it with gratefulness because they've moved into an entitlement mentality. I'm telling you, that's not a royal mindset. That's the mindset of poverty. I want to submit to you. Like the Macedonians, I I, I think there's a kingdom principle being released here. Like the Macedonians, if you find yourself today in a place of need, uh, maybe you're depressed. You're like, I really wish somebody would encourage me. I'm really under it today. I want to submit to you, go and encourage somebody else. Man, the Macedonians, they were under it. It's not like, I mean, they were t- had tangible experience of, of, of impoverishment, and yet they still were like, you know what? We're not coming under this. We're going to get on top of this. We're going to walk in the opposite spirit. We're going to sow and, and create a system where we'll reap. You need cheered up? Go cheer somebody up today. <laughs> you need a friend? No, I've been coming to this church for a while, and I mean, they're okay, they're kind of friendly, but nobody's ever invited me out to lunch, and I'm just kind of feeling a little bit sad about that. Then you invite somebody out to lunch today. You need a friend? Show yourself friendly. 
If you have a need, a, a lack in your life of some resource, maybe it's finances, I mean, whatever it is, I, I want to submit to you, there's a kingdom principle on this where we don't come under the lack. Oh, I've got this lack. Is God ever going to show up? Oh, Lord Jesus, and now it's consumed everything that I'm praying about. Like, it's all about me now. No, no, and instead, we partner with the God of heaven to go, okay, I've got this need. I'm guessing probably there are other people around me that have a need. Partner with him to satisfy their need. Oh my gosh, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? Crazy enough to be kingdom. Just crazy enough to be kingdom. Sometimes we just need to shake ourselves out of this place where it's all about me. And I'm telling you, if we're going to live for eternity, we have to shake ourselves out of that place every day. It's not all about me. There are others that are around me experiencing similar stuff. Why don't I go be the answer to their problem? We fast forward to verse 12. We find out that the Apostle Paul is, is using the Macedonians actually uh, as a tool to motivate the churches of Corinth, uh, to get on board with this offering. It was something they wanted to do anyway, so it's not like he was really twisting their arm, but he was just simply giving them the history uh, of what was going on in an effort to garner more support there in that place. Again, we start in verse 12. For if the readiness is present, of course, he's talking about the readiness to give financially to this need in Jerusalem, it is, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Verse 13. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance may also become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. I, I want to be clear here to, to make a distinction. Uh, the Apostle Paul is not raising up a, a tithe for the local storehouse of the church. He's talking about an offering which would be above and beyond the tithe. And, and when it comes to offerings, sometimes we, we get into this place where we believe that unless we give to a crazy sacrificial point where I personally have lack, then I'm not pleasing to God somehow. Like, if it's like, if I haven't given absolutely everything, if you've still got money in your account, you didn't give a big enough offering. Like, somehow, uh, based on stories of like the widow's might and things like that, we, we get this into our head. But, but this scripture quite explicitly states to us that our offering should not be to our own detriment. As the body of Christ, we're not expected or commissioned by God to give away our grocery money such that our family can't eat. We're not expected or commissioned by God to give away our electric bill money such that we don't have electricity in our own homes. He's not called us to live at a place of, of detriment to ourselves so that other people could have a little something. But he has called us to live our lives in view of the people that are around us. And the only way that we can live our lives in view of people around us is if we're cutting back our own expenses enough to have a little bit of leftover at the end of the month. We call this living within our means. The only way we can live in such a way is to be a blessing to the other people that are around us, to be obedient to the, to the inspiration of God, to be the answer to the problems that are around us, is if we live today sacrificially to pull back in our own lives so that we can be a blessing to the people that are around us. Does this make sense? There's another thing that stands out to me here, and it's the word Equality. It, it, it seems at first glance, when the Apostle Paul speaks of this, it's, it's, it's almost like he's suggesting, well, these people over here, they, they really don't make very much. And so they, they have some needs. And, and you guys over here, uh, you, you make an abundance and don't have any needs. So what I want you to do is I want you to cut everything off the top of what you're doing and, and, and I want you to take that over here and give it to these guys such that the end result is that you and you both make the same amount of money. That's called equal, right? And, and as you hear that proposition, I mean, I personally, I, I can't get away from, <laughs> from the idea of socialism. Sounds an awful lot like socialism, doesn't it? 
And so, and it's scriptures like this that people will take and grab a hold of, and, they, and they'll perpetuate that ideology. And I guess I want to ask the question, here's the scripture in plain black and white. Uh, is that what Paul seems to be suggesting? First of all, we have to define socialism. Socialism is an, is an economic program whereby the government effectively says, your money is not yours. And so as you earn money, it ends up going to a big corporate pot. And then out of that corporate pot, the government distributes it to bring balance in society. In other words, to to make everything equal. So quite specifically, just to make it super, super practical, the the medical doctor who spent 12 years uh, extending his education and has $200,000 in in college debt, tuition debt, you know, and and the guy who chose to bypass all of that and and to, you know, to to go work at a factory who who did not invest 12 years of his life and money uh, into education, those individuals uh, are sifted into the great balance of things and equalized such that the doctor and the factory worker ultimately make about the same money. Is that what Paul is saying? I, I think to identify what he's saying, we have to begin to look at the variables. And the first variable is this. We all right? We've got another 80, 90 minutes, I think. I should be all right. The first variable is this. The Apostle Paul is raising support from within the church to support the church. This is all the body of Christ. This is believer to believer, not believer to world. He's raising money to support the church, the body of Christ that's in need. Now, I'm not for a second trying to tell you that we don't have a responsibility to the world. I I think the the story of the Good Samaritan makes it quite clear uh, that it's quite the opposite. You know, that that we do have a responsibility to our neighbor. Who's our neighbor? Everyone. (laughs) Everybody you look in the eye. That's your neighbor. Go after him. Go get him for Jesus, you know? Like, so we know that we have a responsibility to the world, but did you know that you first and foremost have a responsibility to your brothers and sisters in Christ? We always, scripturally, have a responsibility to our family first, and then to people outside of that sphere. So my immediate family... My primary responsibility is here. In fact, the Lord specifically tells me that if I don't take care of my own family, I'm no better than an unbeliever. My primary responsibility is always my family, and then there are rings of responsibility that span out from there. I want to submit to you that the extended family called the body of Christ is is one of those first rings, the first ring that you get to before we get to the ring of the world. We have a responsibility to take care of our brethren. They will know you by your love for one another. He's talking about your love for one another. As we take care of one another, they will see that and bring glory to God. A famous verse, we always talk about the least of these. Whatever you do unto the least of these, you've done unto me. Remember the scripture? Uh, but, But there's a section that people always seem to leave off, and it's the section that says, to the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine. Who did Jesus say were his brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and so forth? Those who do the will of my Father. That scripture isn't designed to send you to the world. That's the Good Samaritan scripture. The least of these is talking about the church. Our responsibility, first and foremost, is to go after the church. The second variable that I think we have to look at in this equation is the mandate. The Apostle Paul isn't coming to the church and saying, hey, here's the deal. You know, you see all the leg breakers behind me, like the Christian mafia? Hey, yeah, you know, got some boys here, and we're going to get you, we're going to shake you down there, Mr. Carpenter, and uh, we've got a minimum prescription of $10,000. You're good for it, right, boys? Yeah, you're good for it, right? There was no mandate being placed upon the church. There's no requirement that there was a certain percentage. There was no requirement that they even give to this offering at all. In fact, in verse 8, he even goes so far as to say this, verse uh, 8 of chapter 8. He says, I'm not speaking this as a commandment, but as a proving, excuse me, I'm not speaking this as a commandment, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. So I'm not bringing this as a commandment, ah, but what you need to know is that where your treasure is, your heart is also. And this may well, this issue that we've got, this offering, this, this, the fact that we've been moved by compassion to help our brothers and sisters who are under it in a bad way, 
ah, if that's not moving you at all, there might be some heart issues that you really need to bring back before the Lord and iron out. This is telling us something about where your heart is. You know, if we're not moved when the, when the uh, tornado or the hurricane comes through and devastates someplace, like if that doesn't do something, if there's not some compassion that wells up on the inside of us, I, I think we have to take pause and ask the Lord what's going on in our heart. See, he's not giving some mandate here. He's saying, uh, I'm, I'm inviting you into something. At the, at the prompting of God, I'm inviting you into something to have your, start, your heart uh, stirred in compassion to be a part of something that's bigger than you. I only add for reiteration, as we fast forward to chapter 9 and verse 7, it says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So God is inspiring us to give. We're entering into a partnership with him, but I'm called by him to give in partnership with him, not to the point where I'm like, hmm, so tired. I would know, be grudging or if you're tired of pastors always taking these stupid offerings and people always having problems everywhere, tapping my bank account. And always, yeah. No, if, if you're at that point, you've given too much. Maybe you need to to break the mentality. That's a whole other message. It's a partnership with God at the prompting of Holy Spirit to partner with him to be the solution to the problems that we see. What we're seeing here, outlined by the Apostle Paul, this is not socialism. This is generous kingdom giving. This is us being the answer to the, to the problems that we see in the world. This is God's kingdom come through you and through me. It's a partnership moved by him to see something that's bigger than what Something that's bigger than just us. I think the hang-up is the word equality. It's all right. We're coming to a close for those of you who have to pee. <laughs> I think the hang-up is the word equality. You know that word equality can actually be translated fair. What is fair? He's talking about the body of Christ. These guys are under it in a big way. These guys are in a momentary place where they actually have some abundance. Allow your abundance to address the problem. Why? Because they're entitled to it? Because what? Because what's happening to them right now is not fair. They didn't do anything to deserve it. They didn't earn it. I've got Corey Asbury going on. <laughs> you know, when, when, when Katrina comes and wipes out people's homes. They didn't earn it. If you weren't a bunch of sinful wretches, then God wouldn't have sent. No, no, no. No. Jesus said he didn't come to bring judgment. He came to reconcile people, to not count their sins against them. God's not sending Katrina after people and nations and peoples to judge them. What's happening in those instances isn't fair, and it should move us as Christians, as it has for centuries, to rise up and be God's solution to the problem, to take from our current abundance and to balance the scales and to sow in and to, to go and to be the resource of heaven to those people to, to, again, bring back the balance of fairness because what's happening to them is not something that they earned or deserved. I want to suggest to you the idea behind socialism I think is a good one. That people are moved with compassion to give of their money, whether it's mandated or whether it's out of the generosity of their own heart, to balance the scales of life to bless people who have not. I, I, think, it's, I think it's a good idea in theory. But if you've been moved in this current political climate, maybe the previous and you have some sympathy for the concept of socialism, I want to submit to you this morning. I think that you'll make much better headway to go out and make as much money as you can possibly muster and to live throttled back so far within your means that you give 90% of your income into this issue so that you can be the solution. See, we can mandate that everybody be a part of this governmental economic system that somehow balance the scales, but what we end up happening is that everybody takes the road less traveled. I'm not going to go to 12 years of medical school just to make the same thing that you are at the factory. Forget it. 
It's not going to happen. We will all go to the least common denominator. Or we can partner with God's heart for compassion and for people and release the answer and go after this and personally be the solution and model something to people. Not just the handing out of money, but model something of the way that it looks to live in kingdom, something that's possible, and to call them up into something that's way more than just a handout, a Band-Aid, some duct tape on the side of the boat, calling them into a lifestyle that they too, in the midst of their deep impoverishment, can actually, in trusting God, become the answer, the solution, heaven's response to the problems that are around them. And I believe when we do this, the kingdom way, the water level for everybody increases. Amen? Father, we ask that you would continue to expose mentalities that are contrary to your word and to the prescription that we find of heaven invading earth. After all, you did say if we don't work, we don't eat. (laughs) Sure seems to be tied to the concept of sowing and reaping, but then again, I'm preaching. Sorry, I'm supposed to be praying. (laughs) Father, we ask that you would rewire our brains the way that we think. And Jesus, with that, would you use us this season to do this very thing, to model to the outside world what it looks like to be the solution to the problems that we see. Help us, God. In Jesus' name. At this time, we'll call up the uh, prayer and prophetic teams. Prophetic teams can be right over there. And look, if you've been, if you're in a season where you need to hear a word from the Lord, you want to hear what he thinks about you, or you just want a word of encouragement, go see those people over there. They've been specialty trained uh, to hear from the Lord. And the prayer team, we're up here. We want to pray for you for anything. It doesn't matter what it is. You never, uh, you know, I I shared this before. My wife and I, we had, we'll just call them some masses. Uh, She had some.